Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm, my opening comments are going to be short. I want to leave the time up for all of you. Um, in fact, one of the first things I want to do is, well, let me let me just give a little framing of you guys before we jump into it. Um, again, just want to make sure everyone's aware about the code of conduct. I don't expect anything in this session like that. Uh, we're kind of the opposite type of a session of one that I think would have that kind of an issue. But even so, um, if you did have any issues, you could uh, contact info at allthingsopen.org uh, or let us know through side chat here. And we can try and deal with it right here in the session as well. Um, yeah, um, I actually gave some talks related to uh, community professionals and how to take do self care for themselves and for the other people that they work with in the community. Uh, I've done a couple talks over the past few years. The most recent one, self care still better together. I put notes in here uh, from that. Um, but this is not the primary focus of the event today. But I think just as a framing, one of the things I would often do in that talk is uh, this is not a mindfulness talk, but there's a saying in the mindfulness field, which is like, um, let me just look at it here so I get it right. If you think you don't have time to meditate for 10 minutes, then you better meditate for an hour. <laughs> and, and the thing is, for me, that's more of a kind of a proverb thing than actually a prescription. And so what it's really saying is, it's not really talking about uh, meditation. It's not only like talking about how long to do something. What it's really saying is in those times in our lives when we need to take time for self-care, those are the times that we're most likely not to give ourselves permission to do so. And so what that's saying is trying to say, it's trying to give you permission. It's not trying to say to do more. It's trying to say, yes, it's okay for you to take the time for yourself. And I think where it really comes into play with community work and you know how you can be a healthy member in the community, which helps the community as a whole be healthier, is um, realizing that, uh, I mean, there's, there's just a ton of information out there about self-care and about you know, how, to, you know, how to be healthy, both mind, body, spirit. The thing is, it, it's easy when things are going well. It's, it, but when things are not, that's when it's a challenge. And unfortunately, when things are not going well, that's when you're least likely to give yourself the permission to do the things that you know, already know in your head to do. So where I think where the community aspect of this really becomes important is realizing the importance of having other people in the community that are your kind of accountability buddies. There is this commercial, I, th I think it's a Snickers commercial. I don't like the stereotypical gender and age things that they use in them, but I think it was very appropriate where the person is not acting like themselves, you know, a <laughs> uh, young man and they, they portray him as like a, a Betty White <laughs> and, and, and like the friends give him a snicker bar and then he like he turns into his normal self. But the point is the friends are the ones that notice when you're not doing well and can actually encourage you and actually give you the permission to take care. And so uh, without Going too far into that, uh, other stuff there. And then just to give one concrete example around specific community work that I've had to deal with recently as I open it up to hear what you all are here for, because you may have come for different aspects of uh, creating a healthy community culture. Uh, we had an interesting situation in one of the communities I work with where there were a lot of microaggressions, and they were typically microaggressions, you know, against people without privilege in the community. And those folks would felt it would be actually becoming a burden for them to be constantly reporting these uh, these uh, things. Like uh, actually, they felt called out because they were the ones that were always doing it. So one of the one simple thing we did is we added an anonymous way to report uh, because this was an internal team mechanism, the maintainers inside of the project an anonymous way for them to report uh, these types of microaggressions. And that way, the people with privilege who weren't actually the uh, taking the brunt of these uh, microaggressions could actually respond to them. And, and the people that were, you know, people that didn't have the privilege, that didn't feel like they were, this was one more burden for them or that they were being called out for it. And so that was just one really simple way that we could kind of support, you know, the well-being of maintainers in the open source project by um, you know the, some of the people that were taking more of the brunt of that activity. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of like to open it up 
to to hear what others like if there's specific topics i can talk to a lot of different topics in the space but i'd also like to open it up to uh hear what other people have to say including their experience uh in dealing and helping to make their communities run more in a healthy manner One of the things that I like to do is uh, I like to uh, use Susie Nelson's comments on self-disclosure. Like that's what you should always be going for. You should always be doing things that encourage people to affiliate with their community a little bit more so that they're comfortable self-disclosing disclosing, and that builds the momentum necessary to substantiate a culture of self-disclosure. That's great. And I, I, I meant to ask if there was anyone that wanted to assist with note taking. <laughs> uh, that would be greatly appreciated. The document's open to everyone. In fact, so, uh, um, go ahead. Sorry. Samantha, could you uh, mention the name again? Susie who? I don't know the person. Uh, her name is Susie Nelson. Susie. I'll leave a comment um, to her in the resources in the notes. Cool. Yeah, I put, a, I put a little text in there. If you could link something there, that'd be great. I'll say something about having a healthy community. You have to be willing to admit when you did something wrong or when you're weak in some way. Uh, you know, you have to admit you're not perfect. It seems obvious, but people are so reluctant to do that in a group. And when you do that, you allow other people to do that. For instance, I went to a service, a, a large religious service, where the speaker, who was a rabbi, talked about her depression. And she talked very uh, honestly about her own clinical depression. And a lot of people thought it was too much information, but I thought it was wonderful because she gives everybody in the congregation the right to talk about whatever mental problems they're having. Totally. It's the, I, I would categorize it in the area of vulnerability and authenticity. You know, when you, as the leader in the community, uh, model that it gives other people permission to be, you know, uh, to do the same. I've seen some things uh, up above. I don't know who's dropping these things. Oh, that was you, actually, <laughs> Samantha. Probably the Susie Nelson piece. Yeah, um, I, I actually created that image full, full transparency, but it's something that I definitely learned from Susie. Um, she actually has an amazing uh, community management training over at Digital Marketer that I recommend. Actually, I do have a question about that. And it's a little bit more, um, my context is as a manager, but I think it applies to communities where <clears throat> I try to sort of share some things to demonstrate that it's a safe space to share some things, but then at the same time, I don't want to be so like I bring the energy down. <laughs> you know, like in this case, like a lot of us are in California and, you know, there's been struggles around everything that's going on. And then on top of anything, you know, not having clean air and like losing daylight for like a day. And, you know, so I kind of wanted to just make my team feel safe that you know, they can share, it's a, it's a struggle for some of them. And um, yet I felt uh, like it was hard to keep a balance of like then triggering it into a 30 minute complaint session with everybody. And I, I wasn't sure like, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe that's what they need. And maybe like if, if communities together in a conversation, maybe they just need to, to do that. And then you kind of create boundaries so that it doesn't continue on like endlessly and just sort of bring that whole energy down. Um, so yeah, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert on how to work that, but it felt like like it was necessary to say that that space was possible while also worrying that maybe you open the floodgates and then you create the wrong tone. Yeah. Um, I would say that when it comes to self-disclosure, it's important to recognize that um, there's a ebb and a flow to what people prefer in their communities based on the level of communication that they're having. Um, so to kind of clarify that statement, uh, when things are intensely interpersonal and there's very little structure, people seek structure um, because it sets that line. 
Whereas when there's a ton of structure, people feel worried about interacting and they crave that interpersonal connection. Um, so managing that dialectical tension uh, tends to involve a lot of um, setting the precedent for when it's time to be interpersonal and when it's time to be professional. Um, so I actually created a rapport channel in the vast majority of my communities and then I create ritual content um, around people communicating and uh, interacting interpersonally, which generates that self-disclosure while not impeding on that highly structured interface. Thanks, that's helpful. And I do think it helps in modeling and that you're kind of like in the therapeutic, uh, like I statements as opposed to like bitching about other people or other things, how you're feeling and about the things and stuff as opposed to, uh, yeah, because because the other stuff can kind of devolve into a whining session. <laughs> Um, if we're also comfortable moving on, I am actually really, really curious about the same question that was actually asked in chat. Uh, it's oh. difficult being a female project maintainer in a field which is 99% male. Uh, there's constant friction, which tends to get tiring. So I'm also kind of curious what other people are doing in order to approach those issues and make things a little bit more welcoming without necessarily being so overt about it. What are the subtle things you can do to kind of move that culture, I guess, would be a good question. I kind of want to listen at this point <laughs> to the women of experience here. <laughs> I, I can speak to this a, a little bit, some things that we did in, in a couple of the communities. Um, you know, anything from uh like the allies workshops and, and getting you know um some of the men in the community to take this allies workshop and learn how to become a good ally um not just to women but any minority um you know inside of a community um the other thing was you know not just a um just to um say okay we have these women in this in this project and and you know kind of um, voice uh, or, or, you know, raise them up because of gender, but because of merit and make, making sure that, that the merit is known um, and, and that, you know, maybe they're often unseen because I know like I'm not going to go and, and kind of bang on the drum, my own horn or whatever, but other, or, you know, my own drum, but, but letting people see your merit and what you do and how you do it and and that kind of stuff and the other thing is making sure that it's okay and i'm going to just say it that it's okay for people in your community to call bullshit what it needs to be called you know we might have to beep that out but i mean it you know sometimes you just have to you just have to do that when, when it's called and called for and sometimes it's those allies that are the ones that do it you can't necessarily do it yourself because sometimes that um, is seen as hostile but if if you have people who are in your communities that you know are very versed and um, and understanding and know how to sort of facilitate through the conflict or just when to pull somebody in, aside and say, knock it off. Like, what are you doing? Um, you know, and sometimes it's the rock stars in, in a community that are the ones that are actually, you know, causing some of that friction. So uh, again, it's, it's having that relationship where you can either, you know, privately say something and they fix themselves or having allies who call people out uh, publicly and, and sometimes th that helps. That, that's just some of the things that we did early on in um, the Ubuntu community um, when we had our, had a, we had an Ubuntu women's group that really sought to bring in allies and get them trained and, and um, there's a whole allies workshop that, that you can, that you can do, but that's, you know, just a little bit, tip of the iceberg on how we handled some of that. I don't know if that helps or not. I did want to share one specific thing we did that's directly related to this. Um, so we had a policy that was pretty lenient about uh, 
banning people for infractions. And so they got a lot of, uh, that's why we had a lot of this microaggression stuff. And one of the things that we did decide to change was um, uh, doing like the temporary ban, like immediately for people for some of these more minor things um, uh, to, to, to make it less of a, less of a constant thing for people and, and made it more public that we were doing it. Cause a lot of times we would have side conversations with these people and then in the public conversation, you wouldn't see that they were actually being, um, that it was being addressed. So by actually um, taking action and, 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 and not, you know, not giving people a three strikes thing, coming up with a temporary ban kind of thing to uh, that seemed to seem to lessen the burden. I mean, lessen the frequency of it, I should say, because there seems to be a certain actors that were very frequent at it <laughs> and that would get a lot of uh, almost negative attention as a result. Yeah. Exactly. I have the token just put in the notes that that was ex exactly the effect we were seeing, evaporative cooling. I, I think too, the other thing that helps is making sure that people know that um, that the discussion is not a, a hammer, you know, like you're not hitting people o over the head with the hammer just to have the discussion and that people feel safe um, bringing up any of those topics in a in a group to make sure that it's a not I hate saying safe space but it really is like making sure that people can bring bring those topics up inside of your community and feel comfortable talking about it not just women amongst women but um, you know women um, talking to, to everyone about it or, or men talking you know so or however anyone identifies talking about the subject right um, without fear and, and so and so often um, we're made to feel like if it's anything negative, whether it's those microaggressions or big um, issues with, with that sort of stuff, then you can't talk about it because you're you're shaming somebody or you're and it's not about shaming somebody. It's, it's about let's being aware of the issue so we can fix it. And if you're if you're not aware of it, you can't fix it. And so many times people are just afraid to even make people aware of it, you know, on a formal level. So making sure that those conversations are okay um, to, to happen. It, it sounds easy, but sometimes it's not. I will say another thing that we've done with some of the communities, Google open source communities we're starting to do now is do moderate, moderator trainings. There are specific groups that will do uh, uh, these kinds. Of, I, I'm not going to promote specific, but they're easy to find out there. Um, you know, and that seemed to be really helpful because a lot, a lot of it is just ha having people know how to, you know, uh, respond to these situations because sometimes people don't respond just because they're not sure how to respond. And just having our moderators properly trained seems to really help. And also, uh, too, have some trainings available. I'd love to add them to the notes on that note. I guess I guess it'd be okay. I mean, the, the group we've worked with with Sage Sharp is the people we've been working with. But um. um, also wanted to add that um, sometimes I try to pull it away from gender. That's hard because we live in a world that's so binary and forced every hour of our life. You know and. I don't wake up every morning going, I'm assigned female, you know, like it's the world that keeps reinforcing on me, you're assigned female, um, even though you know, that's not how I exist. And similarly, right, I think, um, especially in tech cultures, there's often this thing that, oh, just because there's a bunch of people who are assigned male, that they're happy with the certain types of behaviors that get manifest. And so it's often around then this larger context where I mean, I've been in different companies and different communities where, um, you know, even the engineers are struggling to find a safe space to ask questions, to be able to learn, 
um, in our company like, and in previous companies I've been with, like, you have to actively work to um, say, it's okay to ask questions, quote unquote, dumb questions. There's no such thing. And yet it's not something that once you say it, it's fine. You know, you, you have to like keep demonstrating it and keep um, making that space because basically everybody's hurting too, right? I mean, some people are getting more perhaps um, overt aggression, but I think, you know, once you start talking to people, a lot of them are like, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy with the behaviors I'm seeing, or I don't feel safe. And then, you know, you're hampering innovation and you're hampering collaboration and such too. So, um, you know, if anybody has uh, experiences there outside of just guardrails, but like more of understanding that, you know, it's not just uh, uh, the genders that you see, but the, the, the way it impacts everybody. I hope that makes sense, I'm not sure. Yeah, I really like what you say there. And for me, it goes back to encouraging self-disclosure. Um, like people are not gonna tell you that they're feeling uncomfortable unless there is an environment where they feel comfortable self-disclosing. Um, so using community infrastructure in order to encourage that as well as interpersonal self-disclosure yourself in order to kind of set that trend and get people to actually tell you. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend who shared a story where they had um, you know, some kind of meeting that was supposed to be about diversity. And of course, like the only people who were like assigned female, there were like two of them and then it was like everybody else. And then they proceeded to like say kind of outlandish things on how inclusive or diverse they should be and like not even like asking the general people what they thought. And then um, so this friend who's assigned female kind of talked to a group of the men who were all really unhappy about it. And she was like, why didn't you speak up? And they said, oh, I should have, I should have spoken up. And, you know, and I think that that says so much, not like, oh, those guys were cowards or whatever. It was like, they, it was such an unsafe space. There was so much noise and, you know, aggressive kind of talk that the people who, you know, weren't in agreement just felt so completely unable to say, hey, you know, I, I don't, I don't want even this conversation to continue. And also the assumption of the people who are really loud were like, oh, well, we assume you're assigned male. So you agree with us and your silence means that you do agree with us. You know, it's just like this whole toxic culture, right? That can, um, you know, in a lot of ways is, the, is frequently reinforced. So it just, you know, you have to like keep working at, um, mm -hmm everybody's safety and then hopefully you'll find more people who can speak up regardless of their assigned gender. Just one example. I think another way of making it hard to participate in the community is just to assume that a standard American male white culture is, is the culture and, and other people have to do a lot of code switching I happen to talk to a child of mine who is non-binary, identifies as non-binary, and they were talking a lot about code switching, and uh, I never have to do that. Well, I have occasionally. If I'm with a group of women, especially in um, some kind of uh, issue that's considered a woman's issue, I may have to do some code switching, but usually I don't have to. But it places a real big mental burden on the women or the people of color or whoever has to do it. I feel like diversity is absolutely so huge that we could easily like go on about it the entire time. Um, but if you don't mind, I do have another question that's kind of unrelated, if that's okay. I think I'd, I'd like to, I, yes, please. Um, one of my biggest questions um, that I've been struggling with a lot recently, um, I am a part of a mainstay community where the more powerful stakeholders tend not to allow for autonomy of people who are lower on the rungs, one might say. Um, so how can I increase that autonomy and build buy-in for people who have really great projects and really great ideas and feel comfortable championing them uh, in a community where veterans tend to have more power than uh, newcomers and those newcomers feel disencouraged to participate. Uh, 
You're only asking easy questions. <laughs> um, being a little bit selfish because this has been like one of the bigger issues that I've had to deal with, and I, I haven't found an answer for it. So I, I, I don't. I mean, every situation is different. I, I can say I've seen someone that I work with do this well. Um, she has high trust with those people on our project and she's been really good at getting them to see, um, uh, you know, how they can have more impact by, in other words, you know, like they, they're the bottleneck, right? Because, the, right? And uh, I, don't, I don't know if they, they necessarily see themselves as the bottleneck, but like, uh, and I, I actually think that, it all, I think it all comes down to trust, right? Because I mean, I think they, I'm sure that even these people you say that have high, they're like control. There are probably some people they do trust and don't allow to take on certain things, but the, the, the probably circle of people that has that trust with them is probably small. So I think it's the challenge is building that trust because everybody now in this day and age usually, you know, is over, you know, has more on their plate than they can handle. And so, if it, it, I think if I had the, the trust relationship, then then um, then that would I don't know if that's making sense or not, but I've seen that I've seen that work on, on a project that had that dynamic that I've been involved with. So it's kind of an allyship kind of thing. In this case, it was a woman actually doing the allyship thing, but it was someone who had high trust with the people that. Um, had control of the project and she was able to get them to see and get them kind of kind of use her trust with them to get them to trust other people uh, to, to get involved. And the other thing is a no brainer. Everyone probably knows this is like then it's important that when you do get them to allow other people involved that they, you know, come through, you know, that, that, that the, they see them adding value. So I think a big part of it is getting uh, people having shared shared goals. Like if they know that you should have the shared goal, then and and they see that you're because like someone can do work, but maybe they're working towards a different goal. So it's not really helping them. But if they see that, you're, that you understand their goals and you're supporting their goals and they see you making progress and it's helping their effort, then it's kind of a win win. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. Um, the idea of getting uh, stakeholders that have power to recognize that there are shared goals involved in the new projects below them. Um, I think that that's a really, really powerful idea and a powerful trend to make sure that that commonality is mentioned. I'd also love to hear other people's um, advice uh, if that's also possible of just making sure that the community culture is capable of resolving that issue. I guess the thing to do is to test the waters and see if the person is open to feedback. Um, and you kind of get an idea. And if they are, you can. And if not, I personally, I mean, my approach is to sort of like leave that community, you know, if I can, um, because you just can't, if you're someone who's like not as powerful, you can't really do anything except, you know, sort of get hurt along the way. So, yeah. Just curious, I don't know if it's switching gears, but uh, Van, I know you've been doing a lot of mindfulness work for many years. Um, 
I've been spending my last several months going through what's called a mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which is an eight-week program that a lot of people offer, and there's one site that offers it for free. So um, I just finished it and then uh, starting it again and um, feel like I'll just keep doing it until like the things really start to click and, and start to work. And um, since you've been doing it for a lot longer, if, have you tried any of those practices to bring them to communities for all these various topics that we've been talking about? Like, are there any tools that we could use, even if we're not like uh, well versed in mindfulness that would at least help us to be grounded when these types of situations happen or? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's it, yes and no, because <laughs> it really, really comes down to the individuals, you know, it's like you have, uh, you have to be careful, you know, like, you know, I wouldn't like come into some community kind of Zoom meeting and say, let's all be silent now for the next two minutes or whatever. <laughs> You know, that, that might be like, that might be someone's worst nightmare <laughs> joining the call, <laughs> you know. I uh, I'm thinking more like, because um, at least a lot of what I've been taking in is like, you know, being aware, like not trying to change yourself, but being aware when you're like, so you see something and you need to respond, but you realize like, oh, I'm responding with a lot of judgment and like thinking like, okay, like how can I try to be objective perhaps? Or, you know, maybe you, somebody said something and you notice like you're kind of triggered because of maybe other things so that when you do respond, you're not really responding cleanly to what that person said, but instead you might be bringing in some other things that's not gonna help. The situation might even escalate it. Um, I yeah. Again, it, it, does, it does come down to like being aware that you're triggered because a lot of times when we're triggered uh, without a lot of practice, we, you know, we're, uh, we're responding unconsciously before we can actually, you know, recognize it. But if you can recognize it, then of course, you know, I, I try to do is if I think that the email, I try to take a breath before I hit the send. <laughs> and if I'm still not feeling great about it, maybe I'll talk to somebody else, before, I'll share it with someone privately before I send it, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't have a nice simple answer for you kind of on my end, like, I don't really have any experience in any way with mindfulness necessarily, but I found that um, one of the most helpful ways for me to make sure that my um, engagement in a community is personally healthy for me on a mental and emotional level, I have a lot of anxiety, um, is actually just radical candor. Um, just being like, hey, listen, my anxiety just spiked here's why, can we talk about this? And uh, just kind of fighting through that. And I find that the open conversation, I like to talk obviously, but the open conversation really, really helps me maintain a certain sense of understanding about my place in the community and what my role in it is. I'll respond that um, I've actually been um, debating about whether or not to join um, a community, not, not an open source community, but just a community um, that is primarily black and I am white, as you can see from my picture. And I've done so much mindfulness. I then mindfulness myself out of the picture <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I had been debating joining the community uh, prior to the protests. And then um, once the protests happened, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Um, and so I was af then afraid of being seen as um, like, and not to equate the two, but sort of like when people join a gym in January, like I didn't want to be one of those people that joined and then they just assumed, oh, I would, I would walk away later. Um, so I sort of like mindfulness myself right out of the situation and, and 
jumping off of the radical candor, actually somebody, uh, a black woman recently suggested to me, you should just be radically candid with, with it. Like you really want to be there. You've thought really long and hard about how to join the space, but you're afraid. Um, and so what can I do to help? Um, so that was sort of uh, a connection between that radical candor and the mindfulness. Sometimes your mindfulness can go awry so to speak. Thank you for sharing that. I guess I just one more suggestion that I have that works for me now is to just take a step back, like take a step back for a day, three days, a few days. Um, that can really help um, with difficult situations. it's kind of like the joke that Van started with like if you can't meditate for five minutes you need an hour it's like if you feel like you want to like respond to something really quickly maybe <laughs> 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 you need to, yeah, and, and I actually I do a lot of um like I'll write the email that I know I'm never going to send but I need to just like you know and write it obviously safely so it doesn't mistakenly get sent but sometimes like you need to like um write a, a response or you know whether it's in a chat room or something and let it sit so that you can be present to what's going to be the most helpful response yeah it really depends on the situation because some situations it's best to just not respond and then then to have someone from the community responding uh, uh but then there's some situations where it really needs your authority or whatever uh, to weigh in. If I'm being too honest, and this is like a big omission on my end, I have explicitly refused to open an email that I know is incredibly time sensitive, like I have to do something in the next 15 minutes. I've just refused to open it for 10 just to give myself the breath. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm actually looking at time and believe it or not, we have about five minutes. I think we're supposed to try and wrap up at the 45 minute mark of the hour. Um, uh, the, I'd kind of like to talk about what we'd like to share from this session back to the larger group in the five o'clock uh, share out. Yeah, feel free, feel free to put things in there you think from the session you'd like to see shared out. And uh, you can also verbalize it if you want, and one of us will capture it that way after you after you do that too. Do you want it highlighted in the notes? Well, there's a key insights section at the bottom. So if there's oh, something, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. something you would like uh, to be called out there. I've also been filling out notes, but um, just to kind of point you back toward there, we actually do have the questions that were asked, some of the answers. I've actually copied and pasted some of our chat interactions. Um, and in addition to that, there's uh, several resources specifically on mindfulness uh, that you can find uh, in the document as well. So kind of a souvenir to take home. Well, I just wanted to add one more thing. Someone in the chat said, email is so anxiety inducing. Like I'm old enough for back when we didn't use email at work, like it had just come around. And so you would talk to people at work. You know, people didn't work remotely and you just would go to their office or cubicle and chat. And back in those days, I feel like we didn't experience as many of this like tension or conflict via email or these misunderstandings that go on. So um, I do this a lot more now with my uh, co community managers, whatever it's up is like just to get on a quick phone call where I'll be I'll be like, uh, can we talk for five or 10 minutes and then keep it really keep it to five or 10 minutes and 
have that call if it's doable. I don't know if this is helpful, but um, another thing that I do with my um, a kind of like an accountability group, and um, some of us took this improv class a while ago, and it was sort of applying improv skills to real life. And they would end each one with a conversation practice, and people could um, practice either a conversation that they had, and it was often with a colleague, or yeah, it could be with a family member, but. Yeah, it didn't go the way you wanted, or maybe you're not happy with the way you responded, or you didn't really know how to respond. Um, or maybe you have a conversation that you need to have, but um, you're uneasy about it. And um, we would go through two rounds where um, you could practice the conversation in a safe space, um, and you could play one of the people. Um, or other people in the group could play the people, and um, and then the rest of the people would observe. And so you do this kind of role playing and play it out. Um, and then uh, people then would comment on like what they observed. And so it was both really interesting to see how other people who often aren't as emotionally emotionally um, charged by that scenario um, play out either you or the other person, right? Um, and then uh, it's interesting to see how people read like the body language in very different ways, either they thought it was more aggressive or less aggressive. Um, and then after that, you do it again. And so other people might play the roles. And so you get to observe how people deal with it in very different ways. And um, uh, I think it also brings up a lot of empathy when you see how things are going or you see it kind of away from you. Um, and that's something that I've been doing with my friends. Like one friend was needing to negotiate her pay and she was really uncomfortable about it. And after we kind of created the worst case scenario for her. Of course, real life was much easier. So she just felt prepared and she felt more, you know, able to engage. And so anyway, it's just something we've been doing. It's been incredibly helpful that I help think, I, I think like difficult conversations are difficult often because you don't know what's to come or you don't feel like you have enough practice. So something we do. Other key insights, I want to make sure I don't miss any. Um, like, what's the one thing that you think you're going to take from this talk? That other people are experiencing the same challenges. Just for me, I feel the safety is such a cornerstone, like making sure that the goal of the community is safety and that guidelines are around safety. Um, otherwise, why have a community <laughs> where there's no safety? <laughs> why, why bother, <laughs> you know, um, at least for me. But. When, so when you say safety, you mean kind of like in the way like the Google, like in the Google study where they said in teams, like the most important factor for effective teams was psychological safety. Or... Um, I'm not familiar with the study, but um, I just was extracting from the conversation. To okay, share. all right. I think I'm just kind of mapping my world onto what you said. <laughs> If you don't mind when I share out, I think with, for the respond versus react, I think that's where I'll bring the mindfulness in because I think uh, it's not something you can just kind of decide to do, but if you if you have a mindfulness practice, it will it will help to make space to be able to respond rather than to just react un unconsciously um, over time. It's one of those things where we know to, that we want to be not just react, but it's a lot easier to say than to do. <laughs> uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll look for the Sage Sharps consulting link later to add in resources. Yeah, actually, just so folks know, Sage, I just discovered because my community was supposed to contract with them, um, is no longer doing that work. Oh, they've, that's news. Yeah, um, they were contracting with us and they um, told us that they are getting another a permanent job. And so if anybody knows of anybody else who does that work, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a definitely a good time to share that particular resource post COVID. Like right now. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very, we were pretty disappointed because we heard some really great things about Sage. So do you mean the, the otter technologies or is that something else? Yeah. 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 Well, that's yeah. so funny because I just received an email from them yesterday today with new code of conduct trainings. They may be doing code of conduct trainings, but the consulting stuff we were told they're not doing. So uh, okay, that makes more sense because yeah, I thought we I also thought we had a contract with them to do more co co code of conduct trainings. <laughs> yeah. So it could be that they aren't taking on new clients for code of conduct stuff. Oh. Probably because Google filled up the calendar. <laughs> the training. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> oh, so I should just blame Google. Sounds great. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> cool. so at the top of the hour, do we go to the wrap up? Yes, uh, I, no. we're, te we're technically at time now, and uh, it's the other. Well, if you do go through the all things open site the, the thing that takes you back to the to the closing it's a different zoom session than this one <laughs> so you'll have, you'll have to leave this one and join the other one at the top of the hour all right see ya see ya so thanks every, thanks everybody for attending yeah. uh, today's talk and as uh, van said We'll head on over to the, clo the closing uh, session at five over on track one. So thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. And sorry about my huge amount of conversation, but I really, really, really loved this. Like I, I got a little bit carried away, but thank you. <laughs> Well, that's what these are supposed to be. It's You're supposed great. To be, yeah, you were great. I, I, it was going to be a pretty quiet. I didn't really want to make it a mindful, just a mindfulness session. I mean, so I'm really glad that we had other topics. So thank you. I agree. I think that um, like mindfulness is incredibly important, but it's one of the areas that I lack the most. Like uh, as a community manager, the spot that I am the worst at is being a community evangelist. Um, so it's really, really difficult for me to have all those interpersonal conversations. And I think that this was very, very helpful. Yeah, I think I think I probably could have mentioned was the mindful listening, because I think that's one thing that you don't have to have a mindfulness practice to 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 focus on that, because like if you can work on being a more of a mindful listener with your community, that will. Yeah, that goes a long way. <laughs> I, agree. I tend to be so task oriented and so uh, focused on building the architecture and making sure the systems are supporting conversations. I tend to pay, take a back step. So oftentimes what I'll end up doing is I'll just train facilitators who are very clearly just naturally better at that interaction than me. And I'll just be like, here's the institutions, here's the system. Now go make this system not a machine, make it an actual like living, breathing community of people. Um, Cause I tend to, I tend to struggle with the um, empathy and interpersonal communication part.